Well, I want to start with a little video clip. I was learned in Sunday school class that there are some other clips I could have had that would have been better, but you just won't know what those are. So this one will be good enough, okay? I'm sure. Uh, a camera crew set up a confessional booth, and it just said confessional booth, and people were allowed to come into this confessional booth and be record, record their confession as to what they wanted to make. And I, I thought this one was interesting. It's, it's pretty short. I really don't know what to confess, I guess. Um, work related. I slack off at work a lot when I have to work overnight because I hate that and it's really boring. And I love to go to strip club. Unwork related, of course. Sometimes. Occasionally I go and hungover at work and that's pretty bad, but you know, I'm young, so what can you do? I have to do that. And I guess that's it. I don't know what else to confess. It's really nothing. Well, if this is like churchy because, I don't know, it's like a Catholic thing to confess things. I have premarital sex, and I, I used to smoke a lot of pot in high school, but I don't anymore because it makes me feel lame. And I did shrooms once. That was fun. Felt kind of drunk, but entertained at the same time. And I don't know. I guess that's. I don't know. I guess I lead a boring life. I can't think of anything to confess. If I were drunk right now, I would think of a lot of things to confess. But I'm not. Have a good one. Wow, pretty boring life, right? It's like, you know, she's doing this like to this unknown God. It's just this camera that she's confessing to and don't really have much, you know, some truants, drunk, strip clubs. You know, there's really nothing wrong with my life. Well, this is the last of our series of one another statements which were made by Jesus and the apostles to the church to instruct us as to how to be a community. You know, he said these, these one another's. And, and since this is the last in the series, um, I, I want to make sure uh, that you hear a point about something which has really kind of been a soapbox of mine recently. And just in case you missed it, this is my last chance here. So, you know, just bear with me for a short soapbox rant. The, the point is that God says some very specific things to the church, to his followers and to those who are in covenant with him. And we, we shouldn't expect people who are not followers of Jesus Christ and, and not in the church to abide by those commandments because they just weren't given to them. And, I, you know, this is a soapbox I keep preaching to myself because I always have these high expectations of everybody in the world is supposed to treat me with such kindness and generosity and compassion. And yet, why would they care about these commandments when they are not even trying to follow this God? And the church, I think we need to, to remember this at time and kind of put our judgment sheets away because, you know, it's like, here's the Ten Commandments and here's the Sermon on the Mount and, and the world's supposed to be doing this. Well, the world's not going to do that. But the church is supposed to. See, there, there's a big difference there. And, you know, these, these one another's of love one another, accept one another and serve one another, encourage one another and forgive one another. And today it's confess to one another. They're for us. They're not for the world. This, this is about, these are our commandments. And so, you know, that's just kind of my soapbox that I've been on for a while is that, and trying to preach this to myself too, is that when somebody who, you know, doesn't know the Lord is, is mean or angry or whatever, 
I shouldn't be that disappointed or shocked. Because, you know, these are our commandments. It's not them. End of rant. Well, today we come to our uh, confess your sins to one another. And I know you're probably already turning me off. Uh, I mean, this is an awkward topic. And I know that I'm kind of teaching uphill. Um, because Protestants in America, we naturally believe that our sin is our sin and it's nobody else's business and nobody ever needs to hear about it. This is private stuff. And and so when someone says, confess your sins one to another, well, probably going to get a little defensive on this. And that's why we don't allow you to talk back while I'm talking. And so, you know, <laughs> get this out. Uh, so what I want to do is, is start by con, uh, considering first our sin to God and, and what that means, and then we'll look at confessing our sins to one another. So let's start with a scripture that we probably all have heard quite a bit, 1 John 5, 5 to 10. And he says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, it's a well-known passage. You might even have memorized verse 9. You know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous. Um, John uses light and darkness to stand for, you know, the light is for walking with Christ, and the darkness is for walking in the world. And, you know, the darkness, which is sin, is disobedience to God, and he says that if we, if we pretend that we have no sin, that we're liars, for we have sin. But right there in that word that sounds a little hard, you know, we have the assurance that if we confess our sin, that he's faithful, he's just, he's righteous to cleanse us of, of all unrighteousness. And, and that sounds rather personal. But I want us to look at verse 7 because this stood out to me um, this time as I was going through this passage of Scripture. Verse 7 says that if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. So there we have the fellowship with one another. We've been talking about community so much. And the reality of living in forgiveness as we confess our sins to God has not just implications for us personally, but it has implications for others who are in fellowship with us and the community and fellowship with one another. And we really can't have fellowship with other Christians to be in community with them when we are in the darkness. When we're, But when we're practicing confession of our sin to God, then it improves our community. And that's I don't think that's something that we think about much. You know, we, we think about my sins, my sin, and it's just between me and God. But, but really, there's always somebody else involved, especially when you're in a Christian community. And, and we remember that, that nothing is hidden here. Uh, Hebrews 4, 12 to 13 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So, I mean, the point is, is that we can't hide from God. He sees into us. He doesn't just see us. He sees into us. He knows our thoughts and what we intend and the things that we hide. And nothing is hidden from him. So, you know, we, we can't hide in the darkness because he sees into us. But, but, man, we try. If you're like me, I try to hide in the darkness. You know, when we... It's like when we really have a, a you know a good run of sin going. Excuse me here, but you know like we're just mad maybe for a week or maybe we're worrying over things for a while. We're just into it, you know, just really you know a good worry going on, or maybe we're scheming something or or wanting something that somebody else has got. 
Or maybe it's that old persistent sin that shows back up again. We go, oh man, I've been missing you. You know, you can come on back in because, you know, you're very familiar to me. When you're on a bender, when you're on a sin bender, I think I covered enough to get us all in there. Then the last person that you really want to see is someone that's really living in the light. Because when you're around them, it's like your darkness just shows up. You know, you just know what it feels like. It's like their light kind of exposes my darkness, so we try to hide. So you stay away from fellowship, or you, you avoid people that could help you, and you, you do what comes natural, or we do what comes natural. We're busy, we're, we isolate ourselves, I'm too tired, you know, I can't go, or maybe you're mad about something, or you have complaints, but that's the last place that you need to be, Right? And the place you really don't want to go, you really do not want to be, is around, really, at, when you're on a bender like that, is other Christians. Am I right there? I mean, I'm just dreaming this up. Is this just me? Is this just what I do? You're all looking at me with blank faces like, yeah, Don, you know. No, I think that's pretty, pretty general in the church. And, and that's why God says, confess your sins. Confessing our sins to God needs to be a daily practice that we have. You know, or we will be living in the dark and we will lose our eyesight. And we also lose fellowship with other Christians. Now, we Christians confess our sins to God because we're sinners. Uh, you know, sin is becoming kind of a bad topic. It just sounds like something they talk about in the 19th and the 20th century. But, you know, we're, we're very evolved now and, and uh, we, we don't really, you know, have sinned so much. Uh, sin means we willfully disobey God, and we knew what to do and we didn't do it. Or you know, you know, people like to soften this concept a little. People say, "Well, I made some bad choices." You hear that all the time. I made some bad choices. Well, we even say that about other people. Well, yes, yeah, she's going through a rough time because she made some bad choices. That sounds better, doesn't it? To say. She's sinning a lot. No, she's making some bad choices in her life. That just makes it sound better, right? And uh, sinner sounds, you know, so just kind of judgmental and old-fashioned. So we've evolved in this, and really it's, you know, sin is just about bad people. Guys like Bernie Madoff, you know. Now, now there's a sinner, you know, Bernie Madoff. And I saw, I saw a thing, a quote from him as he's in prison now, and he gave an interview, and he said, there's nothing for me to change from. It's not like I ever considered myself a bad person. Maybe that's the problem there, Bernie. And I made a horrible mistake, and I'm sorry. Okay, you ruined the lives of thousands of people, but I'm sorry. You know, that, that's, that's where he goes with it. Horrible mistake, I'm sorry. That's what people do today. They make mistakes. I didn't sin. I just, just made some mistakes. A mistake is an error in judgment caused by poor reasoning. So we hurt someone, we go, oh, my bad, you know, my mistake. It's not the end of the world, right? We throw all those things in there. Or, okay, so I messed up. No one's perfect, right? Throw that in. I made a mistake. I mean, how can you blame someone that just makes a mistake? He can't do it. Yeah, they just messed up. No one's perfect. He said he was sorry, right? There's a difference between sinners and mistakers. A mistake, I don't have to ask you to forgive me. I just say, I'm sorry, I messed up. You know, nobody's perfect, and let's move on, right? On a mistake. But a sin, wow, that's a different thing altogether when we say that I've sinned. You see, if I'm just a mistaker, then I don't have any sin. And if I don't have any sin, then I'm not a sinner. And if I'm not a sinner, I don't need a savior. If you're just a mistaker, then all you have to do is try harder. Just make a few adjustments. Tweak life a little bit, you know. Uh, I gotta slow down, uh, you know, work less. I gotta take better care of myself. I gotta get more sleep. I gotta stop getting drunk during the week and just do it on the weekends. So I, you know, like that lady said that she didn't, you know, ruin things at work. But if I'm a sinner, then trying harder is not gonna do any good, right? 
Because we're still just a sinner. If I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. The problem is that God does not send His Son into the world to die for mistakers. He sent His Son into the world to die for sinners. He didn't cover mistakes. He didn't cover bad choices. He covered sins. And, you know, you, you might convince someone else that you're trying harder and that it's working, but if you're like me, when you're there and you're looking in the mirror, who I see there is a forgiven sinner. I, I, I don't see a mistaker that's getting better. Okay, I see a forgiven sinner. God says, if you see a mistaker, that you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. So confiners, sinners, excuse me, sinners confess their sin to God because when we do, it says that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He's waiting for us to come to him as sinners. We've sinned against him. God says, confess your sins to me, first to me. If you want to be forgiven, if you want to be clean, feel clean, have the guilt ridden, then confess your sins to God. We may not know how to do that. You know, this is what I'm finding out is that so a lot of the time we, we just don't know how to go about doing that. So, so just a few things there. First of all, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. If you ever want to know, if you say, you know, I know that I'm not right with God. What should I do? Ask God to show you. He's a gentleman. He will show you. He will kindly reveal to you where you've gone astray. You know, he's kind, he's compassionate, he's slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, as we say all the time. But, but it's a work of the Spirit. And the second thing is, is, is do an inventory. Okay, I'm angry, so what was it that made me angry? What, what, what's behind that? Or I, I'm worried, what, I'm anxious, you know, I'm afraid. What is it that's, that's behind this? You know, do, do an inventory there. And, and always, this process is a matter of receiving grace. It's not a matter of paying God off. It's not a matter, matter of being so sorry that you finally appease God. This is a matter of receiving God's grace. Okay, now the second part here. Confess your sins one to another. Let's go to James 5, 13 to 16. This has got confession in it. It's also got some other stuff in it. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He's to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. And there's our one another for the day. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Confess your sins one to another. Now, before we go any further into this part of it, of confessing our sins to each other, I want you to envision a group of people where you feel completely at home. You don't have to hide anything. Imagine a group of friends where you can be yourself. Somebody said earlier today that, you know, we had high school friends that had grown up with through college and we just talk shorthand with them and, and you're with them and you can be yourself. You don't have to pretend to be anybody else. But I want you to feel that place. Imagine the place where no one ever judged you and there were no standards and no expectations whatsoever. And you think, well, he's probably talking about the kind of church that he envisions. Well, not really, you see, because I'm not talking about the church here. Um, the church is a place where you can be yourself, hopefully, the church where you have uh, some close friendships, but it is not a place where there are no standards and expectations. In fact, the church is one group where there are extremely high standards and extremely high expectations of everybody. And you know why? Because... You're expected to be like Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. You're expected to be like Christ. Jesus said, follow me. The things that I do, you're going to do. Do, do you see the bar being raised there for us in the church? He said, love your enemies. You know, Pray for those that persecute you. Uh, if someone asks for your shirt, give them your coat too. 
You talk about raising the bar for his followers, high expectations. He said, you know, it's been said, don't commit adultery. Well, you can't even think about it anymore. All right? You can't even think about doing that anymore. No fantasies, you know, about guys or girls. You say, man, you know, we think, we think this is just a place where, you know, you can do anything you want. Grace just kind of covers it. Not the way the story reads. The, the bar is very high. He, his call on our lives and the standards are extremely high, and we know that. I mean, the thing is that Christians have developed this system of getting by that actually prevents our growth. Uh, first we say, my sin is my business. It's none of your business. Instead of mind your own business, it's mind your own sin, M-Y-O-S. You know, just mind your own sin, leave mine alone. If someone dares say anything about my actions, then we accuse them of judging us, and we say, you know, you're not supposed to judge in the church. And we all make mistakes, right? But sin is the secret. And oftentimes, we play that game. Second, we either pretend that no one ever sins or that we pretend that no sin is bad. The first choice that no one sins is usually accompanied by a lot of talk about sin out there. You know, it's, a, it's about... The government is about society, but our sin, we don't have any in here because we're all fine, you know. But, you know, it's, it's always general, it's never specific. But, uh, you know, the, the second group says that everybody sins, so it doesn't make any difference. So don't worry about it because you're no worse off than anyone else. And they're going to love to defend your right to sin. But in all these instances... Personal sin is never, under any circumstance, told to another person because that would cause all sorts of problems. Because, you see, if this person starts coming out about what he's been doing, then that means that maybe some of us, we can't throw him out, but maybe some of us have been doing some things. Threatens the whole system. Have you ever been in a group of people where maybe you're at a party or something and... and uh, Oh, I've been there for a couple hours, and you finally go to the restroom, and you smile, and you know she got a big chunk of basil stuck like right there in your teeth, you know. Like, man, I, I was with them, my friends, all night, and nobody said a thing. They just let me go on like this, you know. I got this big chunk of thing, you know. I, I've got this. This is this is a bad thing on me, but that's all right. You've got something uh, like you needed it. Um, when, when I see somebody that's really put together, you know, like the guy or the girl that's the model, and, and man, they're just, you know, wow. They, they must be a celebrity. They look so good. And I'm always going to nine. I, I say, I want to go up to him and kind of go, um, right there, um, got a little something there, you know. Just, you run into the bathroom. I've never done it, but, but, but I want to. You know, somebody that's really put together, you just kind of want to go, oh, you kind of got something, uh, mm, just might want to go check it out. Right? But you're around all kinds of people, and, and there's something wrong, but nobody ever says anything about it. It's this huge cover-up. You know, Christians are no different. We, we, we want to pretend that we're perfect, and as a group, we pretend that we are perfect. Back in, in the uh, last year in the G8 Summit, they went to Ireland, and there were all these, you know, world leaders, and President Obama was there, and Angela Merkel, and Russian Pre President Putin. And before they got there, they spent a million dollars in putting these fake storefronts on this little town in Ireland, because the town was actually in severe poverty, and all these stores had closed. So they put these fake storefronts on, so when they drove down the road, it looked like it was a prosperous little village. True story, Huffington Post. Spent millions of dollars to, to do this. So everything looked perfect, but behind it, it was all decayed. You know how destructive that is to life? Honesty begins with God. Sometimes we try to deal with sin that way. Uh, no one here is a sinner. Our sin doesn't matter, but it does matter. It ruins our relationships. It slowly breaks up a church unless it's confessed. And as James says, find someone in your church and tell them. Because if there's going to be growth, if there's going to be real victory, then it has to be brought to the light. It has to, to come to light in the community of people 
who uh, sinners like you and they're people of the cross and they receive God's grace. In one church every year at Ash Wednesday, um, they had this practice, and we've done this in churches before, where they would have everybody write their sin on a piece of paper, and then they would come and and nail it to the cross that they had up for Ash Wednesday for all of Lent. And this year, this little six-year-old boy, he took the time and he had his card, and he wrote it out in big, great big letters, you know, with the Sharpie. And then at the end, he wrote his name on it. And instead of folding it like everybody else had, he left it open and his his parents said, you know, you're going to want to, why don't you put your name on there? You don't need your name on there. And you're going to want to fold that over. People are going to know who you are. And what he wrote, he said, God, I'm sorry because I lie. Then he went and he just stuck it to the cross. And there was his name there on the bottom. God, I'm sorry that I lie. And everybody could see it. And his parents said, why did you do that? He said, I wrote my name on it because I want everyone to see it. Because if they know it was me, then maybe they can help me stop. Oh, what a childish thing, how how true that is. Bring it into light. Now, how do we go about doing this in a practical way? Well, how do we confess to one another? Well, it doesn't mean that we just all stand up all the time and tell everybody everything. My gosh, no. Uh, that that wouldn't heal anything, and it, we would hear some things that we really don't want to hear, right? It takes a rather strong person to hear, to hear somebody else's failings. It really does. But like all things that are important um, and have potential for real change and growth, there needs to be some wisdom and there needs to be some discernment here. So I just thought of some risks. I put them down there in the bulletin. The first, the, the risk is, is is that you're going to be embarrassed, Lord, help you if you're never embarrassed by your sin. We should always be embarrassed by our sin, right? If you're not embarrassed by your sin, then you're really gone a long ways away. So it's going to be embarrassing. Just accept that to begin with. The second thing is, is the risk is it does make you vulnerable. You're showing someone, telling somebody else. Not that it's any great secret, but now you're putting specific things to it. And the third risk that I think here is that you're going to see yourself differently. You know, we all have a self-perception that is inaccurate. Uh, I've always said that for Myers-Briggs, to take the Myers-Briggs personality test, you ought to let the mate fill that out. You know, because, uh, you know, do, do you make decisions? Oh, yes, I always make decisions easily. And, you know, we, we, the way that we see ourselves is never really accurate. So when we start telling someone else what we've done, you're going to change your own self-perception. That's not all bad. But there's some great benefits. And I just want to cover two here because we're limited by time. But the first one is you are now freed from isolation. Satan would have you keep things in the dark. If, If you can keep it in the dark, he can keep you there. And that's why... Sin has so much power is because we try to conquer it alone. But, but when we tell someone, now that's not just me, but it's someone else. And if we believe Scripture that we're two or more gathered together, that he's in our midst, now there's three of us there, right? It's me and my friend and Jesus that know this. And you've got a team of three people. So the first one is it frees you from isolation. And, and the second thing is, is that it's tangible, you know, when, when you confess your sin to God, you never hear those words, or at least I don't. Maybe you guys hear more than I do, but I never hear, actually hear the words, Don, you are forgiven. You know, maybe you hear that voice, but I don't hear that voice. But, but when you tell someone else and you said, I've done this, and they, and they say, you're forgiven, man, those are powerful words. Those, those words just mean so much to you, to, to free you, to give you know, some tangible forgiveness. Now, uh, how to do. Uh, not, not everyone should be told, and not everything should be told. Okay? There, there's a burden, there's a responsibility to have someone else tell you what they've done. There really is, trust me there. And the second thing is, I would choose a mature person Mature, I don't mean old, but by mature, I mean spiritually mature. Someone who trusts in the cross. You don't choose someone that has the same problem. You don't need a counselor. 
That's not what this is. You need someone else that's going to look at you and say, I've heard what you said, and you're forgiven. God has forgiven you. Okay? They don't need to uh, explain how to do life better. They don't need to counsel you. Now, all it takes is another person who's, who's walking with God to do that. And then the third thing here is to be concrete, be specific. You just don't go and say, I've messed up, but be specific on, on what you did. Um, you're confessing more than that you've sinned. You're, you're specific. Um, maybe you don't need to give all of the details, but, but you need to be specific about what it was. Now, in closing, since you might be that one person that someone else comes to sometime and says, I, I need to tell somebody something, would you listen to me? Let me give you some, some coaching advice. Don't look at him or her and say, ah, don't worry about it. Don't say, it's nothing. What, what you're doing when, you do, when we do that, that sounds like the thing to do to make them feel better, that, that it wasn't so bad what they did, but what we're doing is we're really discounting you know, what this thing is. So, so we don't do that. Don't say it was nothing. Don't say nobody's perfect. Don't worry about it. No. You, you for that moment, are standing there to be that intercessor between them and God. And what you say is, I hear what you say, and I want you to know that, that God forgives you. God has forgiven you. His, his blood was enough for you. You know, that's all that needs to be said. Parents, with children, it goes the same way with children. Kids come to you and go, I'm sorry, uh, Mommy, I messed up. You don't need to counsel them. You just, first of all and foremost, you say, you're forgiven. Those words are gold to hear those words. Of course, it goes the other way, parents. You can also go to kids and say, I'm sorry I got angry. Would you forgive me? And they need to learn how to look at you and go, yes, you're forgiven. That's what makes a community. So I hope today that you have someone and uh, you'll probably be asked sometime. It won't be a formal thing with a confessional booth, but someone at some time is going to come to you and say, you're my good friend. I need to tell you something. I want you to know that when you do that, that you are, you are fulfilling uh, one of the privileges of being a Christian that's just so very important to extend to them forgiveness in the name of God. And I hope that you have someone. If you don't have someone, you know, and it's not one person for all times, but I, I want God to open up your eyes so you can begin to find someone to, to serve in that role because no one is exempt from this. No matter how mature you are, no one is exempt from, from getting the darkness out of the light. Let's, let's sit in a word of prayer for this for just a minute. As deep cries out